So I want to introduce the topic of integrated pest control or IPM. It's an overarching method of pest management, not just dealing with weeds, but with all types of pests and involves a variety of pest management methods. And then after that, um, in this lecture, we'll get into weed management specifically. So integrated pest management is unique and interesting because it isn't just um, a method of pest control. It's actually a decision-making process. It provides a framework for looking at a pest problem and approaching it with the least toxic approach to begin with to see if that works. And if it doesn't, then slowly increasing the, the more invasive, usually more toxic uh, management method but it has a lots of different ways of looking at pest control and we'll get into those. Um, but it is, its main thrust is to create the least risk to the environment by introducing toxins. We try, you know, in integrated, in IPM, we try not to use them and we start off not using them if we don't have to. Um, and also the least risk to humans. And this is also saves money and time and um, not just when we think about risk to the environment by using toxic pesticides, that's pretty obvious, but it's, it's harder to um, get your head around these cumulative impacts to humans, especially the ones spraying some of these pesticides that they, they maybe they're, they're able to do it for a few years or longer, but later they might have some kind of disease problem from cumulative exposure to these toxins. Not to mention the users, the end users, not just the people spraying the pesticides, but maybe the people that are using that landscape in some way getting micro doses and that being bad for them too. So IPM um, always uh, kind of steps back and looks at the whole problem and tries to find the least toxic solution first and approach it um, in that manner. Conventional pest control, the uh, the people that took care of the landscapes would go out and see a pest and go back to the gardening shed and get a some kind of toxic pesticide and spray it on there. It, uh, it was pretty simple um, and it was also uh, didn't provide a lot of choices. So with IPM, there's a variety of choices um, and we have to really study the pest itself and understand its life cycle and why it's a pest and what exactly it's doing. And it's, it's the better way to target our control method and not jump right to the big guns, which are the toxic pesticides, if they're not needed. For example, let's look at like flies in your kitchen. Conventional methods are spraying, you know, you could kill them with some kind of fly spray killer like Raid um, or traps, sticky traps are a really common way or fly swatter, of course. Um, the IPM options would be living methods like biocontrol, releasing um, predators of flies, um, uh, something that interferes with their life cycle, cleaning, um, not leaving food out, sanitation, door fans to keep um, the air moving out of the door instead of in so they can't get in and screens. So those are things that interfere with their the way they live and reproduce. And also our expectations. Consider um, the proximity of maybe some your compost pile that's open or a dumpster or garbage can near your kitchen. And that's um, could be the reason they're getting in and you might want to move that. So thinking about um, kind of just more um, oh, bigger picture ways to reduce the pest without, again, having to jump right to the toxic spray. Another example would be finding aphids on your roses, which is very common um, anywhere in the United States that I've lived in the Midwest and here and the East Coast, but um, even more so here where we have a lot of humidity. Um, the conventional method would be you'd spray. When I was a child, um, we had a can, um, a little spray can of um, DDT that we'd spray on our roses on the aphids. Now, <clears throat> in my mind, somewhat humorously, it's like a, you know, putting, a, a, using a nuclear weapon to destroy, you know, a, a, a small outbreak of something bad. It's just way overkill to do these really toxic pesticides like DDT to dust your um, roses with. So conventional methods today would be some kind of spray that's a synthetic pesticide, which has toxicity to it. Not as, not as bad as DDT, but pretty bad. And that would be the way you would take care of that. 
Now with IPM, you'd assess the whole situation. You'd say, well, let's try some, um, a few things. We'll try living um, control methods, <clears throat> releasing green lace wings or ladybugs that are aphid predators, or perhaps using an insecticidal soap, which is basically just soapy water that deters the aphids, knocks their numbers down, keeps their numbers from getting too high on your plant. So you have some tolerance for those aphids. You don't have to annihilate every single aphid from your garden, but you have to knock the numbers down so that the roses are not damaged much more than they can handle. You could also try interference methods, building the plant health for natural defenses. Um, some of the healthiest, most beautiful roses I've seen that are relatively pest free are at Lotus Land where they um, add copious amounts of rich compost and compost tea regularly to their rose beds. And the rose garden is switching over to those methods too. Expectations, um, select less susceptible variety of roses. You can get roses that do not um, attract pests as much, they're, they're hardier. They produce secondary compounds or their physical cellular structure is more um, thick and hard so the aphids can't get their mouth parts into it and they just don't attack those particular rose varieties. You could go that route too. Those are all part of IPM. In integrated pest management, the landscaper asks themselves, how can I modify the habitat to deter pests? How can I change my management practices to deter pests? What are the methods I can physically remove or exclude the pest in a non-toxic way as much as possible? How can I encourage biological controls, bringing in or attracting predator insects that eat the pest insect? And how can I use chemicals safely, safely legally and with the least harm to any organism, including humans and non-humans? Those are good questions to start. And those questions from the previous slide correlate directly to these five methods of control in IPM. Educating, learning about the pests and their life cycles, what they eat, what their predators are, and educating people too about them with signage if you're a public situation. Cultural control, for example, planting pest resistant plants, physical controls, barriers or traps to, to exclude the pest from your area, biological control, bringing in insects that are predators of pests, and reduced risk chemical control, always starting out in IPM with the lowest toxicity chemical control first, including natural chemicals. So now we're gonna go through each of those five categories starting off with educational control methods in IPM. Aside from yourself as the landscape maintenance person, um, besides from you learning about that pest and its life cycle to understand better, so aside from educating yourself, you can educate other people in a public situation like here at Shoreline Park example. Um, it says, you know, do not feed the ground squirrels. And um, sometimes we need to learn those new behaviors to avoid attracting pests that we don't know we're attracting them. Um, leaving food out attracts um, fruit flies and ants and flies. I'm just learning um, about new behaviors. But first you have to kind of learn about what is attracting them and what is it that you're doing that is providing some attractant for the pest. So that's education. Next are cultural control methods. Things that you can do, cultural kind of means what you're physically going in there and changing something in the garden. You're not attacking the pest directly, you're just changing something that deters the pest or breaks up its, the flow of its life cycle. Hoeing, like digging in um, around your plants, that would um, deter the growth of weeds. And that's a lot of what like agriculture does when they till they're trying to manage weeds so um, that's one method mulching also keeps weeds down now remember weeds are part of the greater category of pest ground cover landscape fabric solarization hot water um, a drip torch that drips uh, flaming oil onto weeds mowing and contact oil sprays like burnout those are all great cultural methods of weed control as one of our pest examples some other methods of cultural control 
um, especially in lawns, irrigation and mowing is key. If you look at the picture, the irrigation problems, which is inadequate distribution uniformity, meaning the water is being applied and to some areas heavily and other areas too lightly. So you have dry spots and green spots. That can cause um, some of the turf grasses to die out and some of the clovers, which are hardier and can handle those dry compacted soils to encroach. So if they can lead to weed problems, so proper care and irrigation of your lawn could decrease a pest problem. That's a type of cultural control. Proper mowing and other things besides lawns, pruning and fertilizing, all those things would come under this category of one of the fields of IPM. Another example of a cultural control of weeds is using these hot steam guns that um, literally boils and burns the weeds on the surface, but there's absolutely no toxicity. Sheet mulching is another method of cultural control of weeds. That's when you just in this most simplest form, you're putting cardboard over your weeds or whatever you're trying to kill off and putting mulch and compost on top. There's more to it and you can read about it, but um, that's one way to try to decrease um, weed growth and especially rhizomatous weeds. Mulch is something that's useful for decreasing weed growth, especially non-rhizomatous weeds, meaning the broadleaf ones, not the kikuya grass, crabgrass, Bermuda grass, those things kind of like mulch, so it won't help, but it will help to decrease other things like plantain and clover and um, dandelions, things like that. Some basic ideas and methods in mulch if you're trying to use mulch to retain moisture. Only a couple of inches is needed of an organic mulch like the wood chips you're seeing on the right. But a deeper mulch, perhaps um, four or more inches, will retain the moisture but also will suppress the weeds. If you look on the right you'll see like it looks like a dandelion coming up through those wood chips. That's because it's not a very thick layer. If you had a thicker layer, twice as deep, the dandelion would have a hard time um, pushing up through that when it's germinating. Another form of cultural control for weed management <clears throat> is um, mowing, and it's effective for some things. You're seeing a picture here of giant fields of fennel on the Channel Islands that have really become a weedy problem, especially on Santa Cruz, and uh, mowing or weed whacking down can help knock, the vi knock down the vitality of that patch and slowly over a few years diminish it and eradicate it. So there are alternative views of weeds. If you're a weed advocate um, or someone that likes to see both sides of a situation, you can also think of weeds as um, a positive thing. Um, in a sense, they grow where other things can't grow very well. They usually grow in between the plants and even sometimes between the irrigation emitters. So they're usually hardier and they're in a sense there to heal the poor soil conditions. So um, like I said about so say a soccer field, you saw a picture that was the water wasn't being applied adequately in all areas and you have dry spots. The dry compact soil is also nutrient poor and that's where the, the um, clover can take over because the clover has um, nitrogen fixing bacteria living on its roots so it can gather its own nitrogen and it can handle the bad compact soils and enrich the, those soils with organic matter and nitrogen and in a sense heal the soil, bring it back to a healthier level. So weeds often accumulate minerals that other plants can't and then leave them there as they die and that can be seen as a positive too. In IPM it's always good to understand the organism, the pest organism that you're dealing with and its life cycle. So with weeds we try to look at different kinds of weeds. There's annuals that live for only one year and there's perennials as well. Let's look at annuals first here. Most of the energy is into quick fast growth and reproduction. They don't have a lot of energy reserves. Not They don't have big roots and um, branches or anything. They just grow quickly and things like grasses and barleys, mustards, you know those grow every season. Those are an annual and um, knowing about that aspect of their life cycle will help you in managing them. 
There are other plants, including weeds, that are perennials. They live for more than a couple of years and they split their energy reserves between growth and reproduction and uh, storing energy too in their roots and stems. They can better handle stress because they're bigger and they live multi-year. They've got to handle the heat of the summer and the cool of the winter. Things like Bermuda grass, Kikuya grass, Arundo grass are perennials and they're also all three very big weed problems too. Sometimes um, pulling them out multi-year or sheep bulging and even with I know Arundo herbicides <clears throat> are used heavily when trying to eradicate them from waterways like the Ventura River. Biennial weeds or plants live for only two years. The first year, like a dandelion, it's a very low growing little rosette of leaves and then the second year it produces the flowering stalk and um, reproduces and sets seeds. A little more information on how those life cycles affect your management. So with annual grasses and other annuals, they have mostly above ground seeds and they require light and soil for germination. So mulching and mowing can effectively reduce those annual weeds that are annual grasses in specific. Perennials, they spread by stolons or rhizomes, underground portions, so they don't need germination. They don't need light for doing that, but you need to often mechanically or structurally prevent them from spreading, like with a, a mowing strip or a border, some type of um, edging to that turf that keeps them from growing into other areas. And now let's look at some physical control methods of the IPM. Weeds aren't the only thing that we have problems with as far as pests go in landscaping, but of course the ever-present gopher. Um, this is Francisco Olivares who works for the city of Santa Barbara and he was setting, he is setting here in this image a gopher trap. Trapping gophers is one of the most effective methods. You just have to know a little bit about how their tunneling works, a little bit about their biology and be on it, I mean like every week check your traps and set new traps and you can effectively keep them out of an area but there aren't any foolproof methods for um, for taking care of and eradicating gophers from your property there's traps there's lures there's sometimes um, poisoning but in IPM we do not poison um, unless absolutely necessary meaning we trap and do the non-toxic methods as much as possible Another physical method of um, preventing weeds from growing into your landscape beds or turf. Um, in the upper left you're seeing um, a, a landscaping area that does not have a mow strip. A mow strip would be like almost like a concrete curb or edging that prevents, physically prevents that weed, looks like crabgrass, from getting into your bed or lawn. And on the right there is a mow strip. A mow strip is a physical barrier that prevents one portion of your landscape from growing into the other. And these are all three pictures of turf next to a, a perennial bed where there is no mow strip and there's a lot of growth sometimes of the turf into the, the bed and then things like crabgrass growing into the turf and vice versa. And these are examples of places where mow strips have been put in place, an actual concrete curb or physical barrier that keeps the grasses out of the bed and the weeds out of either. If weeds are in one, it keeps it prevents the weeds from going into the other area. Another physical method of IPM is um, weed fabric, putting down the weed fabric before you put on the compost and mulch, and that prevents weeds from growing up. Weed fabric can be useful in some areas, but if you're going to be using an organic type of mulch on top of the weed fabric, it will eventually break down and you'll get soil on top of the weed fabric so then weeds will grow in the broken down mulch on top of your weed fabric and then it's no longer functional. So I think weed fabric is good if you're going to put something like gravel on top um, of, of it, not an organic mulch that will be able to grow weeds in a few years.
There are also biological control of weed methods in IPM. One of them is using living things like goats, livestock, chickens that can um, clean out brush and reduce weeds. That's not going to work <clears throat> in a residential setting so much, but um, in other settings it could. Seasonal cover crops, a living mulch where you grow something for a while that can limit weeds too and improve the soil. So that's another potential biological method for competing with weeds for space while you control them. And of course, a little bit more well-known biological control of IPM is using insect predators to bring them in or attracting them or buying them and putting them in your yard to kill off the, um, their prey, which are insect pests for us and for plants. Um, they're very effective. They're not too expensive and they're easy to do. Clients like this form of method. Um, one you know, caveat is that your clients and yourself um, need to realize the goal you, with using biological pest predators is to have a lower tolerable level of pests, not to have no pests. So you will have some aphids still and you'll have some plant damage, but it's tolerable and the plants are not unduly damaged and they don't look too bad. So because if let's say you have some roses and you want to get rid of all the aphids and so you get by a whole bunch of ladybug larvae and or ladybugs that lay eggs and their larvae are the ones that eat most of the aphids and then you see there's still some aphids left but you know your roses look pretty good but there's still aphids on them um, that might make you upset but realize that if they ate all the aphids then they would go away the predator would go away and then you'd get worse aphid outbreaks. So you want a little bit of the, the pest there, food for the, um, the predator. You want a little bit of both, as long as the plants are not compromised too much. And now let's talk about some chemical methods of IPM. So when we use chemical chemicals in IPM, you're either, either using a natural chemical or a synthetic chemical of low toxicity. There's a picture of a few there, like burnout, which is just clove oil that you can spray on weeds to kill the above ground portions, and it biodegrades very quickly and has no toxicity to the soil ecology or um, pollinators and insects as well. So those things are really easy on the environment. And those are the things we're focusing on with chemical IPM um, pest control. Is consider the environmental and organismal negative effects of any pesticide you're using. And there's great information out there on the internet to find low toxicity um, pest control chemicals as well, like this one site here, Our Water, Our World. Regarding weeds, here are some chemical control methods. Using corn gluten can help weed seeds from sprouting. You can also use herbicidal soaps to knock down insect populations, um, which isn't related to weeds, but it's helpful to know. Um, vinegar or lemon juice kills a lot of weeds. So does hot water, or like I said, clove oil. There's um, lemon oil derivatives too. Avenger is another one of the chemicals that we've used. And those are all non-toxic, but they mostly just kill the portion of the weed that you apply them to. They don't get to the roots. Avenger has some systemic action, meaning it gets down into the roots a little bit. None of them work as well as Roundup as far as killing the plant and all the roots and everything. Um, but we um, are just compromising on not using something toxic for something that's um, fairly effective but not completely effective. Of synthetic chemicals, there are two kinds. There's pre-emergent ones that's used and sprayed on before the weed seeds emerge from the soil, and there's post-emergents. The pre-emergents are especially dangerous to people and animals because they persist in the soil for a long time, waiting till the seeds germinate. So basically they hang out for quite a while, so there's a greater risk they could get uh, in contact or ingested by a living, another living organism. Um, post-emergents are things like Roundup, and others that are sprayed on the weeds after they are growing. Some examples of pre-emergent herbicides and a few more examples of post-emergent herbicides. 
if in your IPM decision making you've tried something that's low toxicity and it didn't work and you're you're deciding either with your company or your organization or you in your home you're going to go to the next level and that's important you might try Roundup and if you're going to decide to use it remember it's a moderate toxicity chemical it's not low and it's not super high either toxicity but it, it does have some so use it um, very carefully and following the directions meaning use it on a well first you should cut back the weed if you have a weed whacker or something cut it all the way to the ground and when it the, the new early regrowth that's the time you want to spray roundup on it and um, you want to do it on a sunny day so it's growing and actively um, photosynthesizing its its pores its domata are open no wind at all even if you think there's no wind check and um, then you spray it on in a contained area and if you have plants near the area where you're going to spray it that are sensitive put some blankets over them or cardboard to block any possible drifting of the roundup onto them you don't want to damage them especially if they're not your plants you're doing it for a client so that's the way to use it um, some studies have shown that um, 14 to 78 percent of the spray can travel as far as 1300 feet downwind from your target area that you're spraying it even if no wind is detectable so it can move a long ways and cause plant damage and it can last for weeks in the soil and waterways so it does have some toxicity to the ecosystem this one particular herbicide called fiesta is an example of something that's a replacement for for um, a higher toxicity turf weed control herbicide you can read more about it here but it's a good good alternative you don't have to spray nasty stuff on your turf to get rid of the weeds you know and some people do need to get rid of the weeds in their turf and if it's at your home you can tolerate some weeds probably but if it's a a golf course you're managing or a soccer field and um, the uniformity of the turf is really important meaning just one species and you don't want a bunch of different weeds and things in there it changes the way the balls roll etc then you might look at some of these options like this fiesta this little section of the lecture i actually wrote it um, quite a few years ago probably about seven years ago and it seems most students now in most of our society is much more aware of the environmental problems and pollution and toxicity that's out there that could be dangerous so this next little section read through it it's some background research supporting the importance of reducing chemicals in our environment through using methods like IPM I don't have any audio on this part I'll let you read through that on your own and we'll skip to the next section with the next green slide So let's just do a little weed identification. That's going to help you knowing your weed and knowing how to manage it, especially with IPM. This is a great website. The UC IPM online website, Guide to Healthy Lawns, has a little key to figure out um, what type of weed is in your turf or lawn. And um, the first part of the key is it asks you which of those images which illustrated characteristic best matches your weed species you choose one of those three so this is an example we'll walk through okay you pulled the weed out it's on the right there the, the live image and then you decide which of those three illustrations does it look most like broad leaves grasses or sedges hmm let's say broad leaves okay of the broad leaves plants with wide leaves veins branching out in different directions that's what we've decided from that's a description of what you chose from the last time so now which illustrated characteristic best matches your weed species how the leaves are arranged are they opposite are they world are they alternate or basal well i will tell you that these are alternate and this key just keeps taking you through more and more choices it's narrowing down the possible weed that's in your turf so 
you got to this next slide and this this on online system would just keep giving you new choices which illustrated characteristic best matches your weed species hmm, the right one so we got simple leaves we found that out from the last time are the margins lobed or the margins entire smooth excuse me margins entire or lobed or are they deeply dissected like on the left which would be more like a carrot leaf or a poppy they're more like on the right a couple more questions um, do they look more like the plant is a vine or not a vine not a vine are the leaves lobed on the left or no lobes like on the right they're like on the left leaves rounded or narrow well look closely at that image they're they're pretty much rounded and the key uh, spits us out at this cheese weed so you're able to identify it learn something about it and then you know how to take care of it this is a broadleaf turf weed you could use some kind you could use that fiesta on it something that kills broadleafs and not grasses um, and you can also pull them they grow we get a lot of those around town probably mostly from the county mulch but they can get very large and they have a deep tap root in their perennials here's another example of a turf weed on the right walk yourself through this one on your own and I'll meet you at the end and you should have gotten to well if you did the key on the line you may end up somewhere else but in this presentation you can only end up where my slides take you this is plantain it's actually a um, some are native to California and there's a lot a couple of species that are found widespread that are native to Europe and are weeds over here but another broadleaf uh, perennial turf weed here's additional weed ID resources that can help you with your weed management um, through IPM methods.